wonderful welcome. Um, so I'm going to start in July 2008. My parent, or my wife and I had been parents for about two months, two months and some change, and we were at a uh, yet another uh, doctor's appointment. We'd gotten it all clear when my son was born, everything looked great, but then at the two-month checkup, they came and they said, something's weird, we just want to send you to a, a specialist, a, a surgeon, craniofacial surgeon, just to get a second opinion kind of deal. So there we are, freshly minted parents. Again, this is our first child, and we're sitting in the uh, waiting room or the, the exam room, whatever, waiting for the surgeon to come back. And she walks in the room, and she had one of those smiles that sort of betrayed bad news, right? Something bad was coming. And so she launched right in. She said, your son has acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture. And I remember thinking, cool. <laughs> I have no idea what these words mean, right? You know, it's glazed over, you know, trying my best to have a poker face. I remember glancing at my wife like, does she know what that means? I have no idea what that means. Well, the surgeon caught that cue from both of us and, and continued, said, you know how when you're born, your skull's got those soft spots. There's one in the front and there's a couple on the back where the, the bones need to grow together. Well, one of those spots is called a suture. And one of those spots specifically on the back end of your son's head has grown together prematurely. And so we need to go in and fix that. Now I'm going to fast forward and totally change gears to July of 20, or July of this year. Uh, 2022. So my wife was dropping off, or picking up rather, kids from school. The car started making a funny noise, and she calls. We had a, a road trip planned for like a week later, so she calls our regular mechanic and says something along the lines of, "Hey, do you have any spots for me to come in and check out what's going on with the car?" And they were booked up. They're like, "No, can't get you in." And so she's like, "Oh, that's fine. I'll just swing by another car shop and." and see what's going on. So she stops at, a again, a new mechanic, never, never been there before, and she tells him what's going on. The mechanic goes outside, climbs under the car, comes back out, all, you know, typical mechanic, covered in grease, and says something about rotors and something about $400, and then turns and looks at the person, his coworker, sitting behind the, the desk, says something in a different language, and they laugh, the two of them. And then he turns and looks back at my wife and says, we can fit you in today. Now let's fast forward, actually rewind this time, to July of 2019. I was a senior support technician. That picture's really small, so you might not be able to see it. Senior support technician for GiveWP, the donation platform for WordPress. And we get a ticket from a person, and they said, we just sent out an email to 2,500 plus people inviting them to donate on our website, and when they click on the link, they get this. There's been a critical error on your site. So we're getting flooded with people who we want to be donating, and instead they're telling us they can't donate, and they're freaking out about it. What do we do? Technical support is a conversation between you as technical support people and the people that you're talking to. And, and like a good conversation, it's primarily all about how well you can communicate one with the other. And so there's two ways you can engage in a conversation. You can either be actively engaged, interestedly engaged, uh, or you can be flippant, you can be uninterested, and you can be disengaged. I call that second option, and for the rest of this talk I'll be referring to it as that, I call that second option old school support. And I'm gonna make a bold assertion, old school support is killing you. I don't necessarily mean literally, but in a metaphorical sense, absolutely. And if you run out of customers and you run out of money and then you run out of food, maybe it could be physically killing you. But old school technical support, this mentality of, um, and I'll describe a, a few of the, the things there, but what, in, in the old school support mentality, what's the purpose of the first person you talk to in technical support? to talk to the second person, right? Can I talk to your manager? You are clearly incompetent and just the person who answers the, the first row of tickets, I need to talk to somebody who can actually fix the problem. And that's a rampant thing, and I, I will argue it's something that we all kind of uh, subconsciously do, um, but there's, it, it creates a hostile environment and leads to dissatisfaction, really on both ends, dissatisfaction for the customer, dissatisfaction internally, your team does not enjoy their job as much uh, because they spend a lot of time um, 
making people upset. Um, and I think old school technical support is really built on three faulty premises. So first, the first faulty premise. Uh, some of you are old enough like me to remember Steve Jobs. There he is around the same time with his friend Bill Gates. Uh, but Steve Jobs standing on a stage in 2007 and holding a device over his head that no one had ever seen before. It was called the iPhone. And, and I can remember one of the points that he had during this talk uh, of launching the iPhone was, it doesn't need a manual. And again, if you're old like me, and you can remember around this time when you got a cell phone, it came with a manual. It was thick. It was like bigger than the phone in some cases. And it was written in like five languages, and it taught you how to set the clock and how to set an alarm on the phone and how to configure the snake game. And you could do like a little welcome message when the phone powered on that like encouraged you for your day or whatever. Um, and so cell phones came with manuals. So Steve Jobs was standing there and saying, this product is so good that it doesn't need a manual. It doesn't need technical support. So that's our first, first faulty premise of old school technical support is that you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. I would invite all of us to go to the San Diego Apple store and let's check in on the Genius Bar, see how long the line is and see if there's anybody there that needs technical support. See, it's a lie that you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. And we'll talk in a minute about how it can bleed into or wh what that looks like. But I think it's super important to recognize that that's a lie, that there's no such thing as a product so good that everyone will know how to use it intuitively and they'll never submit a support ticket. They're never, they'll never be unaware of how to use the product. So that's our first premise, that uh, first faulty premise. Second faulty premise, this is essentially that we take our, our product or whatever it is that we make, service, product, plug-in, theme, whatever it is, and we have these buckets within the company. There's like the sales bucket and there's a marketing bucket and there's a development slash product bucket and there's maybe finance, whatever. There's all of these different buckets. What we view, well, the faulty premise here is we view uh, support technicians as essentially in the development bucket but they're not good enough to be at the top of the development bucket. They're, they're like junior, junior, junior developers. Like they're developers that if they were better at their job, they would have a development job. And so instead, we just stick them into the development bucket and we're like, answer tickets, ticket guy, ticket girl. D go, go over there and answer our tickets. And there's, it's very easy, and I, I would argue very prevalent, that we view technical support in that same lens. Like what you do, when you read the title of my talk, your technical support philosophy is killing you, you're like, I'm not real technical, so this talk it might not be for me. That might be why the room is half empty. It might also be that COVID has kept us away from each other and the hallway track is really appealing uh, at this conference. Um, and so it's been really fun reconnecting with folks. But that's what, essentially what we do with our technical support teams is that we view them in the same lens, the same category as product development. They're the people that mess with the code. And I'm gonna argue in a minute that that's definitely not. But first, if it was maybe a little offensive to call uh, tech support folks like nerds that aren't even good enough to be good nerds, I'm gonna maybe cast us in slightly better light. Again, I'm talking about myself here. The third premise is that tech support is exclusively holding the hose firefighting, right? What we do in tech support is we're the hose holders. There's a fire over there. You point the water at the fire until there's not a fire and then make, make the fire go away. Well, when you're done, you turn off the hose and you're done. That, that's how we view our technical support teams. And it's a faulty premise of old school technical support is that that is exclusively what we do. We just point the hose at the fire until there's not a fire and we make it go away. And I would argue that, so, Again, our three premises. First, you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. Second, tech support is like Bush League development. Um, that's a NASCAR reference, and it's a dated one at this point. And I'm from the South, so I should probably explain. Junior, junior, junior developers was a better way of saying it. So the uh, first point, you can make a product so good it doesn't need technical support. Second point, develop or technicians are essentially developers that aren't good enough at their job. And then third is that Tech support stops when you no longer need to hold the hose and point it at the fire. And so I would argue that all of us have subconsciously internalized that. And those are big words, so let's unpack them a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. 
When I say subconscious, I mean we don't think about it. Like I, I'm not actively thinking the people on my support team are just developers who aren't good enough at their job. You're not actively thinking that, but subconsciously on some level, I think all of us do that and it works itself out in specific ways. So we're gonna look back at those same three points through the lens of, okay, how does it come out? If I have subconsciously internalized that, or even sometimes consciously uh, internalized that, let's look back and see how, how that works itself out in our real day-to-day -day life. If you've internalized the Steve Jobs premise of you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support, now every time you open your inbox and there's 20 in there, that's 20 little indictments on your product, right? That's 20 people saying, man, if you guys could make a better product, we would, we'd really like that, you know? And, and you'd start to take it personally. So inbox zero becomes the goal if I've internalized that first premise, right? I, I want to make the support tickets go away because they're all judging me. They're all telling me that I'm not good enough at my job or that our product's not good enough. Um, and so every touch point is a bad thing. And I would argue, um, and uh, we say this, I say this all the time with my team at GiveWP, is that every single support ticket is, a, is somebody saying that they care enough about your product to want it to work exactly how they want it to work. So did you see how I reframed it? Instead of your product is bad, it's now your product is worth being angry at. Nobody emails angry, angrily about products that they don't like. They just stop using them. They get a refund and they move on if it's a paid product or they just move on if it's a free product. So if they're mad enough to email you about it uh, or frustrated enough or whatever, every email that you get from a customer or a user is an indication that you're doing something right. And man, that makes going to the inbox a lot better. When you see 25 tickets or 100 tickets piled up, you can say, there's a lot of people out there using our stuff and they care about it a lot and let's go and make those people's day. Otherwise, man, you, you're looking at mental health issues for your support technicians um, because if every ticket's an indictment, every ticket's a problem with you or your product, it's really, really weighs on you to open the inbox in the morning and to see that little number up by the inbox of how, how many tickets there are. And you start doing things like obsessing over time to first reply or you obsess over metrics like how many replies you can get per day because the whole goal is to get to inbox zero. Let's get make these people go away so that my job is done for the day. Uh, and that, that becomes that. So the second premise, if they're just code folks that aren't good enough at their job to get a real coding job, what that looks like, the way that works itself out is heavy lines around scope, where you're like, we don't do that. They, they email with a ticket and they're like, the, your product is not playing nicely with XYZ plugin. And you go, well, we, we don't fix XYZ plugin, sorry. And you draw a heavy line around scope because after all, I just told you that these are developers, but they're just not really even cream of the crop developers. They, they, can't, they can't even fully make our product. Why do I think they could fix XYZ plugin? And so it, it starts with heavy lines around scope. It starts to look like passing the buck when people do have a problem. As soon as I can isolate it down to, oh, this is a problem in that third party solution, that's what you're gonna say when in old school support. You're gonna say, sorry, gotta go to your host. Your host is blocking the HT access file and that's causing a problem. We can't help with that, bye. <laughs> you know, and just you're sending them away. And that eventually will result in disengaged technicians. So your support techs get really tired of telling people we don't do that. Um, and they start to look for other work. They start to look for ways to become a real developer because we've subconsciously told them that they're in this development bucket and they just need to keep working, keep working and someday you'll have a real job. Um, and so that's how that's gonna work itself out. And then finally the firefighter premise. Um, if you've got a bunch of firefighters and their, their whole focus is on just pointing the hose and putting out the fire. Once the fire's gone, I'm good. That person, that technician's not gonna care at all about refunds or about customers going and using different products because they, they took their fire with them. They're like, sweet, <laughs> one less ticket. I don't have to answer that person because they left. And so what you're doing is you're creating, you're, you,
isolation, you're creating isolation internally with your teams. So now the, the things that the marketing team or the, the sales team or finance really deeply care about, you're incentivizing your support team to not care about because you haven't taught them to, um, to care about that thing. You've told them that they're just a, a hose pointer. You point the hose, stay over there till the fire's gone. When the fire's gone, go back in your little bucket and be happy, <laughs> you know? And so what it does, old school support creates enmity. Enmity is just a fancy word for friction. You know, it's creating enemies, uh, enmity. It builds three teams or more, essentially. So you've got your support team or your product in, in one team, and then you've got the theme in the other team. If it, I, I support a plugin, so for the sake of this illustration, the plugin is here, the theme is another team, the host is another team, maybe some other third party plugin is another team, and the user is stuck right there in the middle, not on any team, kind of waving a white flag going, will somebody help me? Old school support creates teams. And I'm from the South, again, so I wanna teach you a phrase that, that will help here. And what we wanna do is we wanna create uh, a team that is composed of all y'all. So y'all is like two people. All y'all is all y'all. And so what, what we wanna do is create a team of all y'all. And so the all y'all is the, the other plugin, the theme, the host, our team and the customer, that's all y'all, on one team together. On the other team is the problem, right? What they're emailing about, what it is that they actually have an issue with. So we want all y'all on one team against the problem. And so that, that creates a better solution for your customer because now they don't feel like you're saying problems with the theme. They're, they feel like you're saying, hey theme, I got a problem here, I think we can resolve it together. And then you, all y'all, <laughs> on the team are gonna be able to help uh, fix the problem. And so that's our better philosophy. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk through kind of what it looks like uh, to create that team, that all y'all team that draws the parties together and aligns them against the problem. But what it'll result in is happier customers, it'll result in a uh, better work environment for techs, uh, support techs, love, being a part of solving people's problems. Um, Vortex love beating a really tough bug. They love being able to fix the problem. And it'll, it'll cause people to gush about you online. If you don't believe me, go look at GiveWP's five-star reviews. We got people that just absolutely love that it felt like we went really above and beyond. And honestly, we, we didn't do much more than isolate a problem with the other theme or whatever. It's just the way we treat people when they come into our support inbox is different. And so I'm not telling you, you need to become a theme support technician or a host support technician. You just need to be a gatherer that gathers in all those other people. And at the root of that is a concept that we refer to as just being an ambassador. You heard it in my uh, intro. I view myself as an ambassador between my company, my product, and our customers, our users. And so it's ambassadors instead of adversaries. That's the whole goal of good technical support is to, to get us all on the same team so that we can, we can help solve the problem and, and go through that. So I'm gonna, for the rest of the talk, we'll talk through what some characteristics of ambassadors and put a little bit more, uh, I know, it, this is a philosophical talk. I hope to put some action points in there, but the real goal is I want us to think differently about technical support. I don't want it, like I, we can talk tactics and I would love to, I'll be over at the Stellar WP booth following this uh, talk and I, I would love to talk tactics with you, but the most important thing that you can learn is how to think differently about your technical support team. So first of all, ambassadors are empowered, like they have actual authority. The concept of ambassadors, if you're not familiar, is a government sends someone to speak on behalf of them into a foreign country. So they have the full power and authority of that foreign country that is sending them to speak on behalf of them. And, and, that, and also to speak on behalf of the, the country that they're being hosted in back to their country. So it, 
it's a full empowerment. And so your technical support team, the people that you are having answer tickets, even the first line of tickets, need to be actually empowered to speak on behalf of your company. Like they, they need to be able to say, you know, when someone comes with a feature request that we know is outside of scope, they need to be able to answer that confidently. And the only way that happens is if they actually have been, you've given them the right to speak on your behalf. Um, so if you're a manager, if you're a supervisor, whatever it is, whoever it is that's answering the ticket needs to be able to speak on behalf of the company. And if they can't, you need to tear down whatever structure that is that's keeping them from being able to do that. And it takes time. A brand new support technician is not going to be able to speak with their full chest about what the, the problem is and, and how, how our company is handling it. But over time, you need to be working to give them that full empowerment. And it doesn't happen right out of the gate. Related to that is they're connected. If internally you've got systems where your support techs or whoever it is that's answering that first line of tickets, where they aren't able to get to the answers that they need for their customers, you gotta get rid of whatever that internal system is. And it doesn't have to be every single support technician is connected to the development team directly you know, managers, whoever it is, but they need to be able to find the answers when they need them to be able to get them to the customers. And if they can't, they're not gonna be able to be an effective ambassador. They're not gonna be able to effectively solve the problem. They need to be connected to real decision makers th so that they can convey that message, speak on behalf of that company. Next up, ambassadors are problem solvers. I gave a talk uh, at the last in-person WordCamp US um, that goes into this more, so you can go watch that. Um, and also tomorrow in the Palm Room, Micah Woods is giving a talk that would be really helpful for this, and Micah's fantastic. So go see that one as well. But the, the point of this one, the, the main point here is technical support is not development. It's technical troubleshooting. And so you're not asking your technical support team to be debugging JavaScript or doing the things that developers do. You're asking your technical support team to be able to reliably isolate the problem, replicate the problem, and then communicate that problem. So their role is not debugging. It's not technical in that sense. It is just getting whatever's going wrong on the customer site to also be going wrong in this other site that then I can pass along to uh, our support team. We use WP Sandbox uh, for that on our team. I'll get it, I'll isolate the problem, get it fixed. This problem is happening right here just like this and then I pass off the credentials to that WP Sandbox to my team and say, go go work on that. Here's here's the problem. And all you have to do is one, two, three and it's, it, it creates that problem. And so, again, I could do a whole talk. It was a lightning talk in 2019, but I could do a whole talk on technical troubleshooting and this one isn't it, but ambassadors do need to be able to solve problems, but I don't want you to hear that ambassadors or that technical support reps need to be your high level coders because that's just not true at all. Next up, ambassadors are winsome. Ambassadors are the kind of folks that you like to go out and have a drink with. They're people that you can hang out with, you can talk to. They are respectful and kind and winsome uh, folks. And so, um, I think it all starts with your tone. We do all email-based support, so um, there, there is in our customer success department, we do have some phone calls and things like that, and the same principles apply. But the people that I deal with every day, it's all about written text. And so I spend a lot of my time harping on tone. In fact, Matt Cromwell and I, years ago, sat down together and created what we call the tone guide. And you can uh, find links to that if, um, I, it's like benlikes.us forward slash tone. I forgot to put it in the. The, the slide, uh, but the tone guide, the goal of that is to help us to have a clear picture of when we need to improve our responses. And so really quickly, I'm gonna run through that. I've got a few minutes to do that. We use an acronym called CREW. The reason that the points that I'm gonna share with you is in this order is because it spells a word that way. I suppose we could have done REC without the K on the end but we decided to go with crew uh, because it sounds nicer. Um, is your support a wreck? No, I can fix it, no. So we asked the question, is it crew? So I'll type out a draft that I'm ready to send or my team will type out a draft that they're ready to send and then they will ask the questions of it, is it crew? And so the, the first 
question to ask of it, is it confident as opposed to apologetic? We have a, a positive and a negative for each um, of the four points. Um, I catch a lot of flack every time I tweet about this, so hopefully I'm catching flack online as we speak. Uh, we don't apologize for stuff. Really, not much at all. I don't apologize even if it's a bug. <laughs> like, we shipped a bug and it's breaking sites. I still don't apologize for that. Um, first of all, because it's WordPress, uh, and the people in this room know that WordPress is distributed software, right? It's once it's on your server, it's not my software anymore. Like it, there's there's a weird dynamic with open source distributed software, where if I do apologize, I'm so sorry for this bug. Now I'm sort of taking a little bit of responsibility for them not testing code that they put on their production site. It's, it's not really my fault. And again, I catch flack for it every time I tweet about it. But we don't apologize. I do apologize when like, I promise them four business hours of response time and I'm replying to them on hours. I'll apologize for that. So sorry for the, the slow reply here. Um, but the main reason that I don't apologize is because it doesn't do what I would want it to do. What I want it to do when I apologize is demonstrate empathy, demonstrate that I, I care. Like I'm a, I'm a real person that cares about the fact that they're having a real bad day because of something that I'm at least in part responsible for delivering to them. Um, but when I apologize, it comes across as sometimes, a, a lot of times in my experience, it comes across as um, kind of weak um, admission that, oh, I'm so sorry. And it's sort of like with uh, the, the apology, when I wanted it to make it seem like I, I'm competent and I can solve their problem, it comes across instead as like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're, they're like, I don't want you to be sorry. I want you to fix the problem. Fix the problem. <laughs> like, I, I don't need anybody to hold my hand right now. I need somebody to fix my website. And so that's, that's generally my philosophy, personally. And I say it like I'm real hardcore and I never apologize. And that's not the case. I do apologize. But I certainly don't lead with apology. Because what they need to hear from me out of the gate is that I'm confident You've come to the right place. We can fix this problem. We're going to solve it for you. And so that's the C. We also sometimes add calm in there, calm confidence. Um, just like with parenting, when your kid scrapes its, his or her knee and they come to you and they're freaking out, what they don't need is for you to have a temper tantrum with them or roll around on the ground with them. They need calm, confident. We, we, you've come to the right place, buddy. We're going to fix this up. We're going to uh, wipe, wipe the blood off, put the Band-Aid on. You're going to be good to go. Your customers need to be treated with confidence and calm. Um, second up, results driven or results oriented. Oriented didn't fit on the slide like I liked it, so I went with driven. Results driven, not argumentative. If you were to make a list of all four of the points of crew and order them from things that Ben is best at to things that Ben is worst at, uh, the R is the one I'm worst at. I'm, I love to argue, like I love it. And I don't just love to argue, I love to win arguments like I, my personality is the type where it's like you come at me with some half-baked logic in a support ticket about something and I'm just gonna tear you up like I, I love arguing and so Matt who was very patient uh, to hire me in the first place but then even more patient over the years to help me to see that even though it's fun to argue it, dev it doesn't work it doesn't help solve the customers problem and even if you win the argument, you're gonna lose the customer. And so we have to focus as support, technical support on solving the problem, the result of the problem, get their problem fixed and ignore the insults or whatever. So if I get a four paragraph uh, email from a, a person and paragraph one is about how terrible our product is and paragraph two is about how slow the support time is and paragraph three is about how ugly my kids are, and paragraph four is about the actual problem with a uh, workable error code in there, I've got to ignore three out of four and answer that fourth one. And uh, trust me, trust me, if you don't ignore even one line of defensiveness slipped in there, you've derailed the whole thing. Now, now we've got to have a conversation about how my kids aren't actually ugly. Like, you know, like we, we've got to fix the problem. And you've got to ignore the insults and you've got to just go with it. And what's fun is that uh, there's a, a Bible verse that's like if you answer somebody uh, with kindness, it's like dumping a uh, heap of coals in their lap. 
it works. When, when you're kind and when you're respectful to people, a lot of times they'll come back and be like, I'm so sorry. That, uh, I was under the gun and my boss was chomping down on me and really mad and I'm sorry that I said the things I said in that first email. Sometimes they don't say it, but I know it's there. I know it's there. So you've got you've to resolve the problem. You've got to be just relentlessly results oriented. Um, and if you're not, you're just taking extra time you didn't need to take. And then the E, educational, not overly technical. This goes back directly to that first uh, story that I started with of acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture, which was the diagnosis that my child received at uh, two months old. Um, I don't know what that means. It's not helpful. In fact, studies have shown that the bigger words you use, the less intelligent you are perceived to be in conversation. Because it's not about how big the words you use are, it's about how well you are able to explain yourself, how well you're able to educate the people that are listening. And so the more educational you can be, the better. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you need to you know, dump it all down to like a third grade level vocabulary, but it does mean that you have to make sure that you're being understood and that jargon is most of the time not helpful. Now, when people reach out with, uh, you know, say a developer reaches out and they're using terms like API or jQuery or whatever, sure, we can talk back to them, but even the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable developer at this conference still doesn't understand how GiveWP specifically works and what the decisions we made when we developed GiveWP. And so I can still be educational to that person um, and speak to them on their level. But the point is, the more technical you get, the better you better make sure that you are educating that customer. Because if they walk away going, a lot of words, I don't know what any of them meant, um, but my website's still not accepting donations. Like that's all they care about. Get the, the problem fixed. And, and avoid the jargon. And then the last point, this one was uh, one that was explained to me back when Michelle uh, Frechette, who works now with the Stellar WP team, give WPs in the Stellar WP uh, organization within Liquid Web. And back then, Michelle was on the team give with me and she helped explain to me um, that thankfulness, especially as an opener in an email, is essentially noise. I think that went out. Essentially white noise. Um, thankfulness is, uh, it's, it's the equivalent of, your call is very important to us. Please hold while we get you to the next available representative. Like, if my call was important, you would have given it to a human. You would not have given it to that machine. Like, that's, that's at best worthy of ridicule. And thankfulness does the same thing, especially as an opener. Thank you for contacting GiveWP support. It's very important to us. I, it, it's just, it doesn't work. But welcoming, being welcoming does. And so sometimes we'll even personalize that welcome. A lot of times I will lead with, you've come to the exact right place. Like I've seen this before and we can get this resolved for you, no problem. You're being welcoming. Or like I said, you can personalize it. Uh, a, a organization that helps with autism reaches out and they're having trouble with their donations. It's like, man, that's a really great website and a really great cause, I really love what you're doing, let's get you back to raising money as fast as possible, and then going. Pro tip, don't fake it. Don't pretend to be excited about the cause that the website that is emailing you, just skip straight to welcoming. Like, don't, don't be like, I really like that organization if you don't, because we don't like lying to people, but we do want to help them with their problem. And so uh, leading with welcome instead of leading with thankfulness is uh, a real pro tip. So that's the, um, the CREW acronym. Um, and so, like I said, we use it like a sort of a checklist, uh, a mental checklist. When I get done writing a draft, before I click send, I just ask it the question, is it crew? Is this confident? Did I apologize in here for something that's either not my fault or it's not going to lead them toward resolution, which is the R? Like, let's, it, am I driving toward resolution instead of revolution? Uh, we're not driving toward revolution at any point. Um, resolution. Um, am I driving toward resolution or am I defending my team or myself? If I am, just take it out. Is it educational? Is it welcoming? And so we ask all of those things. And that brings us back to the, the crux of the whole uh, talk here, is that uh, the point of good technical support, excellent technical support, is that our technical support technicians are ambassadors. So we've got to teach them to communicate with excellence. So ambassadors 
are the ones who um, can deliver the news, whether it's good news or bad news, uh, to your customers, to your users, in a way that moves the whole situation forward um, and helps to do that. So let's return to our three stories. This uh, error message uh, story is actually not just one story. We get this one a lot um, when people reach out and they're frantic about um, what's going on on their website. I've just sent a thousand people to my website and it's not working. And so the, the answer to that is what we've already talked about today is treating it with respect, treating the customer with respect, treating the issue like you understand it. Another thing that I harp on all the time is show the customer things, don't tell the customer things. I completely understand is a pretty worthless statement. It's like saying calm down in the midst of a fight with your spouse. It is what needs to happen. It's probably not going to help it to happen for you to say it. Um, so I completely understand. Don't say I completely understand. Demonstrate that you completely understand. Oh, so the fact that your site is down means that's top priority. So our first priority is to get that site back up by any means necessary, whatever we need to do. Then we'll deal with why it happened. And you take them back and you've helped them if they've got a backup, if they got their host can help them with that. Again, you're making an all y'all team of everybody involved and let's get this site back up and treating them with respect. The end of the story with my wife at the mechanic, she actually sat down and said, yeah, sure, go, go ahead and, and fix the problem. And she sat down and it was just, she just stewed over it for a few minutes. And she was like, that's just not right. And so he, he looked at the mechanic, looked at the girl behind the counter and they were laughing at me and it just doesn't feel right. And so she literally stood up and went outside. The wheels were already off of the van and she's like, I forgot I have a thing that I gotta go do, I don't wanna do this now. And had them put the wheels back on the car and leave. And that's what your customers are doing. Some of them don't wait till you, that you've pulled the wheels off of their website, metaphorically speaking. But when you are unclear in your communication, when you are treating your customer like a problem, or you're not, your customer doesn't trust you, that is what they're doing, they're leaving. Sometimes they'll tell you, most of the times, they won't. And then finally, this story. I'll skip straight to the punchline. So he got diagnosed with acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture. You have to practice that, by the way. Um, uh, he got diagnosed at two months. At four months, he had surgery where they literally removed the occipital bone, which is that back of your skull. They took it off, they flipped it over, and they put it back on. Um, and it opened up the suture um, to do that. And again, skipping to the punchline. There he is, uh, he's a varsity athlete. As an eighth grader, he got a varsity athlete award and we are super duper proud of him. Unfortunately, genetically speaking, he's going to have a ginormous head because he looks just like me and I have a ginormous head. But uh, I am a super big fan of Laura David and that's the name of the surgeon who did the surgery. That's the real story here is that Dr. Laura David, Wake Forest Baptist Medical, uh, center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, what she did by the way she treated me and my wife is she got a fan for life. And she, anybody that wants craniofacial surgery, I'm telling them about Dr. Laura David because she treated me with respect. She was educational. She answered so many questions um, as we asked all of these questions of her. She even advocated for us uh, with the uh, the insurance company when they said they weren't going to authorize the less invasive surgery. Um, she advocated for us and then she came back to us and said, hey, they're not gonna approve it, so we're gonna do the more invasive surgery, but don't worry. I'm really good at what I do. I've done this hundreds of times. You're gonna be fine. Um, and so that's what you can do for your customers by simply treating them, or treating your tech support team like ambassadors that are sent out to your customers. And so our goal is to create raving fans. Uh, and I think that technical support is the best way that you can do that um, on your team because they're the folks that are in the trenches every day talking to your customers. And so my name is Ben Meredith. I'm the head of technical support at GiveWP. 
We are a Stellar WP brand on the within Liquid Web. Thank you so much for your time today. I would love to answer any questions you got. I finished a little early. Hold on a sec. We want to get the live stream to hear your question too. All right, sorry. Um, how, how easy has it been to reach out to other companies, theme developers and things like that to get that conversation going and get on the same team? Uh, it varies. I mean, there's some companies out there that, uh, that are great, and, uh, but the key is how you reach out to them. Like if, if I, if, if, if say I've got a problem with a, a theme and it's doing something, it's not playing nicely with our plugin and it's causing problems. If I just reach out and say, hey, there's a problem with your theme, that's old school support, right? They're, your theme is breaking GiveWP. They're gonna feel just as much like I'm building a wall between me and them as the customer does that I am. And so we will go that extra step if we we get access to the theme, uh, if we can, if it's a free theme or if it's a premium theme, we'll have the customer send us a zip or whatever to get all the way down to an isolated problem that is clear. And then the way I reach out to the theme is, hey, we've got a mutual customer who's doing this and this and this, and here's their website and here's a, a sandbox site where we've got the same thing happening with just our theme, our, our plugin and your theme. and it's all about building that bridge and making sure that like deliver it to them in a way that they can answer without having to do much work. Oh yeah, you're right. On line 35, we're doing this and we should be doing this. And if we just added a filter there, that would fix everything. Will that work? And so it's, it's really being collaborative with that other team um, and not, not just passing it off to the customer. Now I will send the customer because a lot of times with just like with our customers, there's not a direct line to me from like our website. It, it has to go through priority support or whatever. And so I will give the customer a script that says, the GiveWP team said this, you know, what can we do? And I'll, I'll give them exact, the exact words to say, cut and paste this into a support ticket on their site so that they can hear it directly from me. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Other questions, comments, snide remarks? Uh, does your company have uh, your this support, your technical support, integrated into their overall marketing plan? And then, and like, as a as a way down. And how did, and if so, or if not, how do you guys use your support language outside of word of mouth to promote your products? Does that make sense? Good. So you're asking if the support team, like, if the fact that we do good support is part of our marketing. Yeah, like, how, is it do you, is it an expressly a part of your marketing, or and then also do you leverage it in your marketing? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's a picture of me on the website and how great our support is. So, I mean, it you clearly you know what you're working with. Um, but no, we do. Uh, it is in the marketing materials that uh, that our support is. Uh, we we advertise the the two to four business hours first response time and the three to five days uh, av on average that we resolve uh, customer issues and our happiness ratings and things like that as appropriate is definitely in there. Um, but it's more so, I would say it's bet the best marketing happens internally. And, and I love making my team and myself aware of how we can help the rest of the team. So if a customer comes to us and they've got all of our plugins except for this one that makes lots of money for them and helps them in a really good way. Well, I should, I should probably mention that. Now, I'm not a sales team and our team is not a sales team, so priorities one through five are resolve the issue. And then after that, man, it, another great way we could help you is this other add-on or whatever and, and upsells or whatever you wanna call it. But yeah, we do, we do mention our support um, as a part of pre-sales calls and as a part of uh, that for sure. I don't know if that answered your question. We've got a question over here. Hold while the microphone makes its way to you. That's right. Thank you. 
Um, how do you discipline like yourself and your team to stop and go through crew? Because <laughs> one of the things that me and my business partner on uh, business coaching side of things, we we try to remind ourselves and we tell people to use the acronym HALT. Mm -hmm. don't, don't do anything when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Right. Right? But you know, we tell ourselves That's this solid. and we tell other people that, but we don't always follow it. Yep. Right? So how do you discipline your team to yeah to that, that that is an excellent excellent question because it and that's that's really the answer is in the question it's a discipline it's a practice the crew is not like something that we put together it's like matt and i were like we're really good at this so let's put it out there it's actually we struggle with this um and so how can we be better at moving that and so one of the things that we do is post-mortems so anytime there's a negative rating uh, whether it's a one-star review on uh, the repository or on Google or wherever, or it's a, a negative rating of our individual support technicians um, within the uh, support ticketing system, we'll do a postmortem and we'll say, what, which one of the four crew points did we miss here? Because you can almost always, even for the reviews like the Tech, support techs hate this, but it's like you'll you'll get a review and it's like the support technician was wonderful. However, your product doesn't do A, B, C, and D, so therefore, one star. You know, it's like oh, you were rating me, you weren't rating my product. You know, but I, I firmly believe that even that review, there's probably a point in crew that could have fixed that or maybe prevented that. Now, obviously, there's there's no way of knowing it, and you're doing it. Uh, after the fact so but it's always a super helpful way for us to look through and see okay I led with um, jargon here or I, I didn't clearly explain this thing you know like I, I was wasn't educational or the uh, am, uh, am I done done all right so I'm, I'm done I didn't clearly explain the thing or whatever so postmortems are a huge part of that um, so I think that means we're done I just got the zero over here. So thank you all again for having me.